You are now entering the Mix You podcast. No credentials required. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode numero dos of the Mix You podcast. My name is. Lee, I didn't Lee know Fields. you spoke Spanish. I don't. I'm a redneck, and that is the only two words I know. Numero dos. Welcome to the Mix You podcast. I am Lee. Uh, my rude partner in crime is Hefe Sandstrom. That's three words. Uh, maybe. I'm making it up as I go here. And the one, the only, Mr. Andrew Stone. Hola. <laughs> Did you say hola? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. What do you guys we might doing? need to start over. No, this is perfect. Let's see. No, we're How not starting over. Hey, everyone, here's a peek behind the curtain in podcast land. You can start and stop these whenever you want. For all you know, this is our fifth attempt, but it isn't. It's our first. <laughs> and we're going to let it roll. Here we are. How you guys doing? Rocking it, man. I'm it's good. all good here in central U.S. Okay, awesome. So, Mix You Podcast. For those of you just now joining us, uh, this podcast is based on some events that these guys and myself started a couple of years ago, Mix U. It is a non-audio conference for the front of house engineer. You can learn all about that at mixu.rocks and on social at at mxuroks. Uh, we got some events coming up. Uh, we got one in Tulsa happening really soon on July 17th. We got one in August in Atlanta, September in the D.C. area. October in Dallas, and there are still whispers of Europe, faint whispers of Europe coming before the end of the year. We'll see how that goes. We're feeling. I'm the hearing tongue. ABBA songs in my head for some reason. I'm, <laughs> I'm in love with ABBA right now. What country is ABBA from? Uh, let's see. Stone will know this. There's also, you know, I I hear songs like "The Final Countdown" by Europe. Groups yeah. like that. I, I wonder where they're from. Hmm. I hear it's, Def Leppard. Huh. Yeah, we ought to look into some of this. <laughs> <laughs> are, are they all from Sweden? Is that it? No. Uh, the first two are that we oh, mentioned. Got ABBA and I, Europe. Yeah. I ruined it at the end there with the Def Leppard. <laughs> I'm not picking it up. I'm the young one. But that's okay. I remember when people were wearing uh, bandanas around their thigh because the dude on Pyromania did that. Jeff, you remember that? Absolutely. Yeah, and I was just like, how come I don't have a cool bandana like that? So when yeah, I finally got I, one. I, I remember s- that. Yeah, yeah, you do. I stole <laughs> one from my sister's room, bandana, so I could look as cool as the lead singer nice. on Def Leppard. But it wouldn't fit around my thigh. So I was like, my whole life sucks. I can't be as cool as that guy. It was over. That's so awesome. then you started trying to play drums one-handed, and yes. it was all good. Yes. Now, see, but we remember when he had two arms, right? It's true. It's very true. So. I don't know how to keep up with this conversation. <laughs> I think we need to move on. Andrew, why are there a stack of waves boxes behind you? What Dude, is that? I was sick of being the uh, loser in the three of us at our Mix You events. And uh, every time the waves conversations would come up, I'd just be sitting there like a jerk, not knowing what's going on. That's why. No, so. uh, <laughs> honestly, when uh, when we upgraded consoles uh, two years ago now, I guess, right about two years. Has um, it been two years? Yeah, it was. So let's see, it was, yeah, August, two years ago. So we're just a little shy Man. of two years. We upgraded consoles from analog to digital uh, to, to solid state logic. And I honestly didn't feel like I needed anything. I think I told you guys that. It was just like, there is so much amazing stuff on board. I'm just going to rock this. And being a noob to (laughs) digital, honestly, I really didn't need to overwhelm our situation with, hey, here's more new crap that you don't know how to work. You know? Right. So I, to be totally transparent i've been watching some of the cool stuff you two have done at mix you and i can get most of that to work and it's all great but there's just a few little bells and whistles that i'm interested in that would be i think i'm there now to be able to you know did you just say bono is coming to tulsa (laughs) what no you said you two have been doing at mix you 
I thought that so, was a... Well, maybe maybe he is going to come to Tulsa, and I need to be maybe. prepared. So <laughs> maybe we could improve the mix. So, uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> just... Uh, Shots fired. So the Waves thing, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be cool. Um, so we jumped into a server and trying to get the controller and all the different plugins that two really close friends advised me to get. <clears throat> wink, wink. And we're going to see what happens. So. Huh. so here's one thing that I would say to those of you who are listening who are maybe new to plugins or are experienced with plugins. Either way, there's sometimes is this sort of myth that you think, okay, if I could only add plugins, then that'll save my mix. Well, you're, you're, you're hearing now from a guy who has had a great mix for years and is just adding waves into his system, not as a sort of something to save him from something he needs. It's just to add another color to the toolbox. So, you know, anytime we talk about this, it's like, you know, he's got great tools at his disposal in his console. And so do you. He's just looking for another flavor or another character or another way to shape tonality. And so, you know, I think it's a it's a really healthy conversation around plugins yeah. to always remember, you know, these things are just another tool in your toolbox. And some of it's even uh, resource management on on just the side of having a digital interface or digital console. Somewhere the computer runs out of room. I mean, you can have the most yeah. sophisticated system in the universe, and you keep adding stuff to it. And somewhere it's gonna, it's a computer. It's gonna get slow, and you need to create some space. So some of that factored in as well. Going, man, if I did have an external uh, server that is not running a console, I could actually do a few things outboard on it, bring it back in the console uh, via Matty, and like, it's very, very simple, and free up a little bit of room to do some other useful routing things that I that I need to do just to you know, serve our church. So yeah, in the same way that you would use outboard gear in analog world. That's right. You got, you got a rack of stuff off to the side. It's, it's the same principle. So it, I'm looking forward to it. I think we're, uh, we're starting to get it all put in It all. Uh, it all has shown up now and trying to get it rocking. So hopefully here, uh, we've got a conference coming up. Hopefully I'll be, uh, enough of, uh, an aficionado to not completely embarrass myself. We'll see. I think you'll manage just fine. <laughs> so maybe our next podcast should be an eight-hour session with Andrew uh, being frustrated over how these plugins are supposed to sound. Right. Or, yeah. or, or how many of them I use to create my verbs now. You know, uh, for me, the plugins, um, it's like a source of inspiration for me. <laughs> it like keeps things interesting. It makes me want to keep learning as the, and they're getting cheaper and cheaper, which yeah. is awesome. And by the way, this is not a paid segment. No one's p- paying us to do this. But Waves, if you want to send us a check for this, it's uh, P.O. Box 1176. Thanks. Um, <laughs> 1176. Do you like that? Um, that was good. No, but it really is. The, the stuff's getting so cheap. You know, you can get a plug-in for $30 now. So it's been a cool way for me to just get better and stay inspired and... You know, when you see other people mix and they're using tools, you go, oh, how do you use this? So like, oh, you use an Arvox. Like, wow, that's cool. Let me let me try that. So a lot of plug-in stuff for me, it's tools. Like you said, I think that's the perfect description. Um, but I've really found, especially this year, it's kept things interesting for hmm. me on the educational front to go like, I need to stay on top of my craft. And you know, I just love mixing and it just it makes it fun that's using cool. that stuff. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking totally forward agree. to it. That was a good way to describe it too, as a tool. I'm. It's like when you used to add a new effects unit or something to your, to your arsenal. Um, yeah. Back in the days of the quadroverbs and stuff like that, I remember when you'd finally figure a way to like run all the engines at the same time, and you're like, "That's cool," and it makes you think about what you're going to do. I'm looking forward to that. There's some. There's some cool tricks that I think you can be just as creative with in in a plug-in land as you can without so absolutely yeah it's gonna be fun and i like your shout out to elisa's too that was good (laughs) yeah they could send us a check as well it'd be what would their what would their p.o box address need to be um uh p.o box midi verb (laughs) three 
I took you back. <laughs> yeah, it did. I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thank yourself that you don't. Okay, first digital console I ever used, DM2000. Dude. It's pretty so, good. That's pretty good, right? That makes me seem older. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's, I'll tell you the story. It's a quick one, and it's funny. So I'm on a traveling festival in 2004, five. It was called Shout Fest. You guys remember that? I do. Remember Shout Fest? So it was a stage line trailer, and it was a weekend thing. It was a, I want to say it was like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I'm mixing for one of the like five or six o'clock slots. And I had a buddy who was stage managing. His name is Phil. Hey, Phil. Hope you're listening. And I go to front of house the first day, and Weston Smith is the front of house tech. It was a CTS uh, gig. And I go out there, and it was about dinner time. So Weston's like, hey, are you good? Like, you've used this console before? I'm going to go to dinner. And oh, me, no. being the, like, 19-year-old or how, however old I was, maybe 20, I was like, yeah, bro, I got this. I got this. this. <laughs> Told me. And if you've ever used that console before, it might be also the most difficult. It's a disaster. Console to use every, ever. Every time I've touched it, I felt like I was always one button away from where I needed to be. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Or I've never like spun my hand in a clockwise direction so much on that console. So I picked up Calm and I called Phil. He was over in a monitor world doing something. And I was like, hey, can you come to the front of the house? And he's like, yeah, sure. So he hops down and he runs out there. He's like, what's up? And I go... I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and like, it, Lee's the a coolest big liar. Thing, <laughs> I was totally like, fake it till you make it. I think I wrote that book, but I had a couple guys that totally knew what was going on, right? I so love it. He, he was like, dude, I got it. He set the console up for me, routed EQ, compression, ver like, he basically mixed the show for me and then helped me save the file. Here's the file you go. You know, it, it was awesome. So thanks, Phil. Dude. That's so funny. You need to yeah. uh, pay Phil points on your entire career. I should. I, you know, he and his wife let me stay in their guest house in Nashville, so I never had to move there. So I stayed in Knoxville while I was touring and would just drive in, stay in their house in Murfreesboro, and get on a bus. It, it was great. See, the great thing about Mix U is that you never know where these rabbit trails are going to lead you. So <laughs> that was you, have a good to, one. you have to tune in every month because you'll be surprised, I promise. Yeah, it's great. That was a good one. Mix U interview, Robert Scoville, part two. Hey, take some notes. This guy is probably smarter than you. Wink, wink. actually uh that involves people skills well your emotional state is part of your skill sets in that gig you know and i you know i've I've talked about this at some church um seminars and workshops and stuff you know of talking about you know you need to have a really good look in the mirror and understand how you are going to react to criticism because you're going to get it and you yeah. know what I always kind of preach. I preach is sorry for the word preach there, but you know it, what I try to preach to guys with that is that I don't care how silly or how crazy the critique is that you're going to hear from somebody coming up at that booth. You owe it to the people in that church. You owe it to yourself. That's huge. And you owe it to everybody in that organization to examine it because there's probably at some level there's probably one scintilla of truth in what they're saying. You know, mm-hmm. if it's the 80 year old grandma that comes up and says, I don't know, it's too loud, you know, whatever it's going to be, you got yeah. you got to just let it wash over you a little bit, embrace it and go, OK, I'm going to go over and sit where she's sitting right now. I, I need right. to understand what's going on. You know, you, yeah. you have to do it. You have to. We uh, we're in the middle of this right now. I'll take take this as an example to tell a story. We are merging with a church in town. It was a dying church. And it's a much older church. It's. I mean, we're talking like multiple uh, 75 and up yeah. in this yeah. church. And what we do that's like to our core, I mean, it's loud, it's rocking, it's high energy. Well, we've been over there 
trying to get them up to the same thing. Wow. And then yeah. it's just recently got to this volatile place where people are starting to complain a lot. They're starting to leave the church. And these people have been going to this church for 30, 40 years. And it's not just one or two. We're talking like multiple dozens of people. Yeah. There's a group of seniors there. It's about 200 people, like 75 and up. So what uh, we did was uh, Lincoln actually got together with this group of people, like 200 of them, and just talked to them. So let him get to know him because he felt like we needed to like put some goodwill forth and to let them know like, Hey, here's why we do what we do. So he went to Nordstrom and he got <clears throat> two gift boxes, one really small and one really, really big. <laughs> and he put an Apple watch in each one of them. And he went in front of this group and he picked out two of the most faithful people there. And there's two older ladies and they're in their eighties and says, each one of you get to pick one of these boxes. So they made a big deal of it and they pick a box and they both open them up and it's the same thing inside. And he goes, okay, guess what? This is what worship is to us. Volume is just the packaging, but what's inside is the same, no matter what volume it is. It told that uh, it was amazing. And then now you wouldn't believe how much goodwill just that established with him. It's, of course. it's unbelievable. That's absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant. And I think, you know, in the church, Again, especially in the church, we should we should be better at this than anybody, and we're so bad at it. And I, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, you know, the fruit of the spirit is not sarcasm and you know defensiveness. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, goodness, kindness. It's like why can't why why can't we respond in ways that reflect? who we're supposed to be mm -hmm. in that moment. And yeah. I think we're part of it goes back to that being just so defensive and so afraid that somebody's going to find us out or something. And it's like, guys, we've got to get over that because yeah. like you said, even if the, and I think the reason that we don't take complaints like that seriously is because we, we know that the person giving the complaint doesn't know how to explain right. what they're hearing. And so we think because they can't say it technically or because they don't know we, we just assume they don't know what they're talking about. Right. Yeah, but it's your not point, real. you know, there is truth in there. There's, it's it's yeah. in there somewhere. But yeah. It's in there somewhere. So they may not be saying it the way you think you would say it, yeah. but it's important because there's something in what you're doing that they're, they need to talk about. And so I think just having a posture that yeah. says, okay, how can I receive this with humility and grace and challenge myself to go, okay, where is the truth in what they're saying? Yeah. That, that's and why. How can that. I, I think that's why it's so important to engage that person when they're they're delivering yeah. that critique. Yeah. You, know, you can't just you can't good vibe them away. You've got right. to engage them and understand. And, and I'll, I'll I'll give you a, really what I think is the textbook example of it. And it actually was the basis of me uh, writing an article on it and doing the seminars that I did on it. And it happened at uh, the church I was attending in Scottsdale, uh, where we were we were kind of going through a similar thing that you were going through, Lee, where we were changing over uh, music productions and. You know, there were there were younger people on stage. There was, you know, it was a different animal. You know, you, you could tell mm -hmm. we had shifted it. And we were having a particular challenge with one couple there uh, that was really vocal about what was going on. And uh, we sat down and chatted with them and stuff. And in the course of the conversation, I, I wasn't really, I, I was there to talk, but, you know, the, the head pastor was there kind of leading the conversation, et cetera. And I was just kind of listening and picking up on what was going on, only to find out that, what they had a problem with was not volume. They, they were expressing it as volume. Right. It's too loud. We, you know, we don't like that kind of music, you know, blah, blah, blah. It had solely to do with distorted guitar. Yeah. It, it wouldn't have mattered what volume it was. Right. The fact that it was a 23 year old up there playing yeah. the distorted guitar, <laughs> that yeah. was the key. That was the linchpin, you know? And, once it, it, I, I, w I so wish I would have had Lincoln's example there. I mean, it, I could have used Timex watches and had just as good of effect. <laughs> but you know, I, I, you know, it was a similar thing. You know, it, their their distraction was completely distracting them from the message, from yeah. the content, everything. You know, and they yeah. were losing as a result of that. And once we kind of opened their eyes to that, I mean, we had we had a similar result. Lee, it was just we came about it from a completely different angle. Yeah. But that was the idea. You know, you had to you had to open their eyes up to what was actually being expressed there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once they had some empathy for that and then everything was fine. But, you know, if if we would have just sit that, let them sit and stew over that, we would have lost them with, without wow. question. You know, the, the part B of that, I think, too, is uh, 
and again, I'll use, you know, kind of being a father as the, the learning tool here, you know, when I'm dealing with children. And, and by children, of course, I mean the artists that I'm working for. No, <laughs> boom, boom. Uh, but, um, you know, it's about the language you use too. you know, and I, and I mean that right down to the very words you choose to engage with them. And, uh, you know, that I, I learned from, at a very early age as a, as a father that if you wanted your, wanted your kids to relate to you, you can't pick them up and talk to them. You can't raise them up Man, to your good. level. You've got to get down on the floor and make eye contact with your kids and then they'll engage you. If you pick them up, they think they're in trouble, Right. So yeah. if you use that same concept, you know, when you're talking to these people who are layman's, they, they don't know the language that we're going to speak. That's really right. good. I mean, if you catch yourself using the word SPL or OSHA or, you know, decibels, when you're talking to these people, you've lost already. You've lost already. You're, you're literally trying to blind them with science. You've got to speak their language and translate it for them. Translate what they're, you know, you got to translate what they're saying to you. You got to, you know, you got to be both translator and communicator at the same time there. It, it just, it, if not, you're going to fail miserably R there. Robert, have you had anybody come to front of house in an arena with their iPhone DB app and it say 135 DB and they freak out on you? Yeah, I, I got one better for you. This is, this is classic. <laughs> this is classic. So I'm in Nashville. We were doing Nashville with Petty last tour and I've got my smart computer up. You know, and it's doing yeah. FFT, but you know, in the smart window, it always shows SPL, <laughs> right? right. Well, I, I haven't calibrated. I'm not using it to measure SPL, <laughs> and it's off by like 40 dB. I mean, it's literally reading like 144 <laughs> on on the screen, right? <laughs> so the show runs at about, I mean, at its peak, energy wise, it's about 102 A weighted, 102, 103 A weighted. So of course. There's some music row producer sitting about two seats behind me who's <laughs> and he is tweeting out during the show. Oh it's 150 dB at the show. I can't <laughs> believe how loud it is. I, it just going just flaming me. Absolutely flaming me. You know? Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, right. So moral of the story is we always have a calibrated SPL display now. <laughs> but, you know, it, what it proves to you is that perception is more powerful than truth sometimes, you know, so. Yeah, man, that's huge. And I think another thing that, you know, you talk about not using uh, overly technical verbiage to, to lay people, I think the same thing applies between the booth and the Ooh, stage, too. Question. I think there's, especially in churches, there's a, there's a time where we have this sort of communication gap between what's happening in the mind of an artist versus the mind of a technician. And if we go to them with words like, you know, if we don't have a common understanding of what words like bright or harsh or muddy or punchy, what do those things really mean? You know, even if we think we're communicating with each other without clear definitions of what those things are, it's, it's going to be difficult. And as techs, I think we can't just go to them in terms of kilohertz and, you know, DBs if they're thinking in terms of warm and organic, yeah. you know, it's just a different no, language. You, you so you can't expect anyone how, to speak your language. You've got to speak their language. Right. And, and it, so how have you navigated that, especially with an artist who might be, um, I don't know, you work with a lot of high profile artists who, you know, so there, there's, there's a relational side between you and them that has to be built in order for them to, in, for there to be a trust yeah. factor and all that. So what does that look you've like gotta, for you? You've got to find it out. I mean, you've, it's, it, honestly, I, I consider it a skill set. You, you've got to go be able to kind of feel the waters or test the waters a little bit with artists and see what they're capable of or what they'll tolerate, et cetera. Because, you know, that language thing is, is an amazing piece of this because, and I've, I've done it and seen other artists react to it. If you start using, you start using the scientific jargon, they just shut down. They, you might as well just stop talking. They, they don't hear it. They immediately believe I don't understand it. And then it's going to go to another direction and usually it ends up bad, you know. So you, you've got to speak their language and you've got to find out how much they know and how much they can tolerate. And I, I'll give you a couple of different examples of this, you know. Um, and I'll use some bands that I've worked with over my career. I, when I was with Def Leppard, very studio savvy guys, very studio savvy guys. They can speak 
a lot of the language from a studio lexicon point of view. You, you meaning they can use the studio lexicon to to give you, uh, you know, communication. But if you use live sound jargon with them, they, they don't get that. They trust you with that. You, you've got to go in and speak studio language to them if you're talking about it. You know, I, hey, Phil, I think this part, you know, let's, let's take your parts, Phil, and let's, I'll split them out out front so we can create a two-track, a, a, a dual guitar arrangement. You know, I'll have a dry guitar on one side. We'll delay it, an exact copy of it, but we'll flange it and put it on the other side to simulate what we're doing on the record. They get that totally. Interesting. Yeah. Totally. <clears throat> But if I was going back to them and say, I don't know, man, there's something in the PA system, you know, you know, you come at it from a different direction, stop talking. They, they're they not going to get it, you know. Same thing, you know, like uh, when I was working with Rush, very, very similar thing. Very, very savvy guys, very experienced guys. They've been around it for a long, long time. You know, they get it. You know, you could you could talk on a pretty technical level with those guys and get it across. And the danger that comes with that is they know when you're bullshitting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can't got fake an answer, you know. I got a guy who does that. Yeah, yeah. One, of my, kinda... one of my first weeks at, at the church, Link's on stage and they're checking ears, and he says in the mic, so everyone can hear him, he goes, hey, the washer on the stage right crowd mic's a little loose. Because <laughs> he heard it. And we're like, no way. Sure enough, it was rattling. The subs under the stage were making it rattle, and it's just clink, 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 clink on Lena's right ear, and he knew it. That's yeah. that's funny. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's uh, you know, a lot of times guys that are that savvy will ask you questions to uh, I, that they already know the answer just to, to. Bait you, yeah. right? <clears throat> yeah, just to just check to where you're at, you just kind of see how you're doing, you know? Yeah. I so think that, for yeah. somebody who cares, who cares about arrangements, who cares about parts. You know, as a front of house mixer, you're sometimes the only person who has a feel for how things are working together. And so a challenge for some of our listeners is going to be, hey, guys, you need to learn some music theory. You need to learn how to play an instrument. You need to learn how to tune a guitar properly. You need to learn, you know, not just what EQ is and what compression does, but from a musical standpoint, you need to get some inspiration that might be a little different than what you're what you're bringing to the table currently because it's that producer mindset that's going to help everybody just reach people better because the parts that we're playing and yeah. things that we're doing are more inspiring well, so yeah and it's i'll tell you something I, i've had this happen many times not only just in church world but also in the world i live in here as well where you've got to change their perception uh, and their perspective because the stage perspective is a very unique perspective. No one has that perspective other than the person up there playing. And I, I do this all the time where I, I will drag band members back to the console and either we'll be in virtual sound check or we'll be listening on headphones and say, okay, let's have a listen to what, what's going on, you know? And without, without fail in every one of those sessions, at some point there's this epiphany of, oh my gosh, they can hear me playing that. You know, it's like, right, exactly. You know, oh, oh my gosh, I, I didn't know I was playing that poorly ag against the bass player. You know, those kind of things, you know. It's like this wake-up call. And then when they go back, there is a whole new level of focus up there. You know, so That's you great. just kind of got to keep that going back and forth and make them understand your perspective. It's like, hey, this, you know, I, I have that happen all the time where even here in Petty Land, you know, I, I had it happen yesterday where guys were, I was in playback and they were walking by the room and they were kind of picking their head and going, Man, that sounds freaking great. Is that how it was that today? We yeah, you recorded like, that today. I was like, like yeah, give me a raise. 20 minutes ago, you just played that. Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, but it's perspective, you know, that, that perspective up there yeah. is very skewed compared to what's happening out front, you know. But I think tools tools like virtual sound check and things like that are indispensable for yeah. that. And so for for those of you guys out there who aren't doing that, you know, maybe you use it as a way to kind of hone your own skill, but man, the challenge to get your band out there and listen to what they've played on the recording. Um, that's a huge tip yeah. just to, to, to give them a completely different perspective. That's, that's awesome. Well, it takes courage. Well, you know, I, I, you know, yeah, for, as, on both for as much as I'm a, you know, a proponent of virtual sound check. I mean, I invented the dang thing. So, you know, I, I, I was I'm about all to for tell it. everyone that, <laughs> but you know, the thing that comes with that and, and the, the thing that's very, very real is the first time you ask that artist to step out in front of the PA and listen to what you're doing. That's an exposed moment. 
yeah. you know, and there, you know, it's a scary moment. I mean, it's a really, really scary moment for a lot of people. I mean, if you want something that'll make you pucker, that's the one. Yeah. You better have giant nuts and tight underwear. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> because that artist, I, I, I went through this, I've told this story before, I, you know, I don't know how much time we got here, but, you know, the, the first time that artist comes out and listens to you, you know, that may be the first time they've ever come out and heard how they are presented to the audience ever. Wow. Right. Yeah. So if you think first impressions matter, believe me, that first impression right there matters, matters big time. So I'll give you this, I'll give you this story. I'll try to encapsulate or give you the reader's digest version of it and think about that first impression impact. Okay. So I think I did my, I attempted my first actual virtual sound checks uh, in probably 1994, 95, somewhere around there doing it in analog. And I had been doing it kind of undercover secretly for many, many years. You know, it was kind of my, uh, my secret weapon in the petty camp for a long time. So now we get all the way out to 2005, right? So I've been doing it for 10 years now, 2005. And Tom has no idea that we've been doing this. You know, I mean, the band doesn't know we've been doing it. Nobody, I, it's something I kept very close. It was like, okay, you know, this is something I'm developing, you know, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. So we're in rehearsals in, uh, at the Paramount stages in 2005. And this is right when the first venue console had come out and it had integrated virtual sound check in it, you know? So I decided I was going to come in early one day, um, into the, into the stage and, you know, just kind of tear things apart, tear, tear apart mixes, listen at input level, you know, just kind of break things down from the, to the very basic elements and build it back up again, uh, just for practice, all these things. So I'm in there and I am, the PA is blasting. I'm doing all of this stuff for a couple of two, three hours only to turn around at some point and realize he's in the building. He's sitting at the back. He's kind of come to do interviews, et cetera, and he's been listening to that entire process. Oh, my God. I mean, you talk about getting to see how the sausage is made, you know. <laughs> and I, I remember, I mean, I'm getting chills on my arm right now just thinking about it. I remember just having that moment of absolute terror oh, crap. of just thinking, what did he just hear me do? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just taking inventory in my mind of what did he just hear me do to his vocal for 30 minutes here? You know, <laughs> soloed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, all of this stuff, you know, you're just immediately taking this inventory. You Only were using to... the pitch shifter, weren't you? Just <laughs> half step increments. And... Oh, my God. Thank God I wasn't using auto tune, you know, <clears throat> but, you know, he kind of walked up at, at when I took the break, you know, and we kind of made eye contact. And then he walked up and he goes, wow, that's probably the greatest thing I have ever seen in my life. He, you know, he was like, I, I had no idea we sounded like that out here. You know, and immediately you're thinking, I'm hoping he thinks that's good. I'm hoping he thinks <laughs> <Yeah>. that's good. <laughs> you know, but we had this really, really great moment of of bonding there. And, you know, from that moment on, I, I knew, I, even though he trusted me implicitly, I, that that moved up to an order of magnitude right at that point right there. Where all of a well, sudden, when that happens, know, he, he trusted me. Then... Yeah, and he's approaching what he's doing with a different level of confidence from totally, the stage because totally. he knows that it's being translated the way he had in mind, you know, in the first place. Right. So that that just builds so much, man. That's great. And the the, the funny punchline of the story. I'm sorry. Let me jump in and give you the punchline here. So when I really knew he understood what was going on, was when he he kind of stopped me for a minute and he goes, "Can you do this at monitors too?" Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's when I knew. I was like, okay, yeah, we're on to something here. So the way it finished up was on that tour, we did four sound checks, four actual sound checks where the band came in the building. This was 2005. We have not done another sound check since that week. That's Whoa. incredible. Not one. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. In 12 years, not 12 a single years. sound check. They've wow. never been in the building for a sound check. And, you know, Tom's really funny with it. He's like, yeah, we stopped doing sound checks. It can only break up the band. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're still going. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. So I take credit yeah, for that. Awesome. I take credit for the uh, Heartbreakers longevity, you know. I saved so, them. So great. So Guns N' Roses monitor guy is really the one to blame. <laughs> <laughs> Whether he is or not, he is. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for all of your insight and wisdom. I, I wish we had more time because I feel like we could talk for hours. But That's a long bus ride. Keep it going, you know. Yeah, we're kind of <laughs> out of time. But, um, you know, just as a final thought, what 
what are you what are you using nowadays for inspiration? What what's the like what's the thing that you look to musically or not just to kind of I mean it's been a long career and you're you're doing great but you know keeping it fresh is always you know especially in church world there's this mindset of Sunday's coming and the monotony and all that. So what what's inspiring you these days? Uh you know the thing that inspires me really as much as anything is just um still evaluating music, like still listening and exploring for music. I, I still get incredible joy out of that and incredible inspiration out of it. I, I, I mean, I've talked, I, Andrew's heard me talk about this. I know, you know, that, you know, people talk about how do you train your ears? How do you, you know, do all this stuff? I, I say, that's easy. It, it, you know, if you have a brain, you just have music on 24 hours a day. You're yeah. going to process And if you have a mixer's mindset, whether you know it or not, you're breaking apart that music and trying to figure out what makes it tick. And you're going to use those things when you work, whether you believe it or not, you know, even if you're not concentrating on it, you know, so that's one of the things I have. I, I, I am constantly searching out new music and it's on every hour of every day in my house, just playing in the background. So it doesn't matter genre wise either. And the other piece of it is just trying to mix different music. Like I, I, I got an opportunity this year to do a lot more, I mean, really traditional jazz mixing uh, in Arizona. We have a great, fantastic facility in Arizona called the Tempe Center for the Arts. It's a beautiful concert hall, world-class concert hall. And they've kind of uh, enlisted me to come in and mix the bigger name acts that come in there. And it's just been so much fun to do that. Because, you, you, you know, it's a completely different approach to mixing, you know, when you're doing traditional jazz as opposed to, you know, big rock shows and things like that. It's, it's so much fun. So much fun. Right. Totally different approach to every instrument. Really. Totally. That's great. Yeah. That's cool. Well, we can't thank you enough for being a part of this conversation and just love the fact that you'd be willing to give, you know, so much wisdom to these guys. And, um, I hope we get to do it again. I would love really, it. I would love really it. been fun. Anytime. And, you know, if you want me to join your conversation at the uh, the mix you events, you know, all you got to do is call. I mean, I, <laughs> here's I, the thing, I, I make some time for you, let's, Lee. I, you know, I know you would, but let's be real. Here's what's going to happen. You come to mix you and I hit play on my tracks and then I immediately look at you for approval, which I'm not going to give. Right. So, right. So <laughs> right. The, 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 I actually would give the audience one of these. <sighs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if it's like, oh, so 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 that's what you're going to do with the snare drum, right? Hmm. Really? <laughs> uh, you well, know, it's it's kind of like the, the 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 virtual sound check story you told about you know Petty standing in the back of the room watching and that pucker moment for you. That's what it would be like for all of us. all day long for eight hours, <laughs> yeah. dude. Eight hours. That's why I want to be there so bad, buddy. Come on, make it happen. Help a brother out. We'll we'll see what we can I do. I need some joy in my life. Come on, bring it. <laughs> Oh, guys, thank you. I, I, I do appreciate it. And I, you're going to return the favor at some point because I'm just getting ready to start a podcast for Avid. So, you know, I'll have you guys in. It's oh, that's awesome. Sound based, We'd love so. to. It'd be great. Well, yeah, thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Man, we'll yeah, see you absolutely. Guys. Thank <laughs> All right, you. Thanks, man. Hope to see you around on the road sometime. Take care. Stop All by right, and see, see us. Okay. Yeah, Bye. we will. Okay, we'll see you. Bye. So this has been great, guys. Man, there's so much meat in this episode. Um, I hope everybody can digest it all right, but these are great topics. This is stuff that matters to everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. Encourage you guys to uh, stay tuned. Uh, subscribe to this thing. Give us a review, only if it's good. If you're going to give a suck review, just keep it to yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're excited about what we get to do. We're excited about what we get to talk about. We hope you sense that in some of the stuff we're saying and some of the banter. But uh Give us a follow, check out our upcoming events. Um, you can always look at the website, mxu.rocks, mxu.rocks. Very difficult to uh, forget that one. Uh, check us out online uh, at MXU Rocks. And uh, man, we're there for you. So thanks again. We'll look forward to uh, talking to you guys again here shortly. Peace out. See ya.